You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. In today's episode, John is joined by Dr. Stefan Alexander. Stefan Alexander is a professor of physics at Brown University. He is a theoretical physicist specializing in cosmology, particle physics and quantum gravity, specifically string theory and loop quantum gravity. Dr. Alexander received his BSc in 1993 from Haverford College and PhD in 2000 from Brown University. Notably, Dr. Alexander is also an accomplished musician. He uses music to explore the interconnections between physics, mathematics and technology. He has performed and collaborated with Will Calhoun, Brian Eno and others. Dr. Stefan Alexander, welcome to the program. It's great to be here. Now, Doctor, you work in interesting areas of physics and you also are known to, how how should I say it, as you say in the book, no one ever died from theorizing. So if we don't toss out interesting new ideas, then we don't innovate within physics. So what's your view on that, on innovation in physics, thinking about maybe even new physics and thinking about ideas that some people might not like? Yeah, that's a, you know, it took me a while to figure out how to even articulate that. And um, I think it's the first time actually I'm articulating it in live. Let's see. I would say that one of the things that I was hoping to get across in the in the book is let, okay. Let me give an analogy here. So, take I don't know Richard Feynman. I don't think anyone will deny he's a great physicist, <laughs> and he's you know Feynman is a master. So, no one doubts that Feynman knows his physics and he knows foundation foundational things in the subject matter and has those tools. Yeah. So if he's advanced new physics, let's say unknown physics, it could just simply be that that unknown physics is just a, a play on known physics. But it's also possible that it can be stuff that's outside of known physics. The, and, but in order to, you know, to even sometimes go there, you need to have a command of the, of the basics and the tools and whatever. So for me, it's kind of like putting yourself in a situation that to explore new directions within, in any kind of, let's say in physics, um, theory, I'm talking about theory making and theory building, theories that are beyond our current theories. It, I was just making the case, I'm making the case that you necessarily could benefit from, you know, from having, uh, exploring wilder ideas, let's say, than what's now accepted. Well, there was a time where general relativity was a wild idea. Right. Exactly. So when we look at the brink of these discoveries, like relativity, as you said, quantum mechanics was another one where what it was, what some of these ideas and the mathematics actually was telling us about reality was weird. Faraday, I I talk about Faraday, just this idea that he was going to explain how uh, how moving uh, an electric current far away from a bar from a piece of metal will turn into a magnet and vice versa said oh they're just you know what's responsible for that are invisible field lines of energy so it's just like kind of sounds kind of woo woo and spiritual it's like some invisible poltergeist you know causing these two things to interact and it, he was a laughing stock until maxwell came and confirmed that, that that you know that electromagnetism is a field phenomenon. And actually, now we know that everything known to us in our standard model are fields. Now, quantum mechanics and the strangeness of it, which it is truly strange. It is non-intuitive, which is why people had a had trouble <laughs> buying into it until the evidence was overwhelming that it was the case. Within that, we have a very strange experiment, the double slit 
experiment. Could you give the listeners an overview of how that works? Yeah, so I'm going to give a sort of um, very, um, you know, cut to the chase explanation. So imagine that you are facing a screen, like in front of you, a, a screen, and there are two tiny little um, slits, like two openings, okay, very close to each other, and they're both vertical, let's say. So two tiny little holes that are um, very rectangular, they're, and they're parallel to each other. But the rest of the screen is completely blocked up, okay? And so you can imagine then shining light through those um through those um those to to the to the screen and the only light that will get out is the light coming through those slits so that's a that's the experimental setup but now we can do a modern version of, of this experiment which is there's a gun that can shoot one electron which is a quantum particle at a time towards the screen and you would expect that what you would expect of the electrons are particles is that some particles go through one hole some particles go through the other hole on an average, you see, if you try to collect the electrons and when they you know, go through to some other screen, so there's some other screen behind the, um, the screen the electrons go through, and you could collect the electrons, what you should expect to see is that the electrons pile up in two little pairs right behind the holes, right? So you get two distributions, two regions where the electrons are, 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 have, are located, and the rest of the screen will be devoid of electrons, okay? Actually, so because electrons are quantum things, what we see is the following. We don't see the particle-like thing. We see actually a wave pattern, as if you were putting light waves or water waves through that those two slits. You get interference, and you will see bands of electrons piling up um, in one area, and bands of electrons not piling up. And you'd see something akin to the electrons behaving as waves. Waves. So then you go and you, you become short again. You write down, you do quantum mechanics. You write down a, a, a wave equation to, to say electrons, therefore, are waves. But the, the bizarre thing is, if you go to interrogate at the slits what the electrons are doing, because you're like, if they're waves, I want to see what becomes of the electrons as particles, right as they go through those two slits. It turns out that act of measuring um, the electrons there results in the electrons actually behaving as particles when it hits the screen. Um, and then you do the, the following experience. You don't look, you know, then you see the electrons behaving as waves. Then when you go and look again, the electron behaves as particles. What are they? And what's going on with the electrons actually right when you are looking or not looking? This is, um, you know, as Richard Feynman says, captures, and I forget exactly what the word is in my book, you know, basically the mystery of, of, about quantum mechanics. The act of observation affecting the outcome, is that well understood? It, you know, do we know how that happens or why that happens? Yep, this is called, the, this, your question is basically known as, and it's people, experts in quantum mechanics still debate about it. This is called a measurement problem. And whether or not quantum mechanics itself as a theory contains the necessary physics to explain how the observation is affecting the so-called collapse of the electron's wave function. They, you know, meaning when I observe somehow its particle-like behavior manifests itself. And when I don't observe, it's as if the electron just goes back, back to behaving like a wave. Whether quantum mechanics, if it could take the observer into, into account, how that actually happens, okay? This is a realist perspective. But then there's another perspective that says actually, so there's a present quantum mechanics is incomplete at explaining that. But then some people say quantum mechanics actually is complete if you accept the so-called many worlds hypothesis, the so-called Everett hypothesis, that different acts of observation splits the wave function up into a branch of the universe where you see the particle-like thing. And then, but there's another branch where you're not watching and it's behaving like a wave. So anyway, that's a whole long discussion, but it, the answer is it's a measurement problem, which you just mentioned, and it's not, to, in my opinion, something that's resolved. How the observer play, what is the role of the observer in, in this, these types of processes? And if not, how do we, do we need to change quantum mechanics to address that issue? Now, 
This brings in another out of the box thinker, and that's probably an understatement. Dr. John Archibald Wheeler, who came up with a variant of the double slit experiment. Could you explain the difference and what he found? Oh, you mean the you're talking about the delayed choice experiment? That's correct. Yes. All right. So the delayed choice experiment uh, again, it's a you know I'm not an experimentalist, and in my mind, experimentalists are the real geniuses because they have to figure out ways of teasing these secrets out of nature. So I'm not going to do justice to the details of the experiment. So let me give you the bastardized theorist um, version of it. You know, so just like a double slit experiment, you basically what you do is you have a detector at both the, you know, the um, region where the electrons go through the slits, but then you can actually have a, um, a way of, you know, not making the observation there, but make, making the observation at some later point after the electrons go through the slit. And if you, the idea is that if you delay your observation, whether or not you can actually get a real sense of what the electron is doing in its flight, right? And it shows that in the double, even in the delayed choice experiment, even if you delay the, ex, the electrons, you delay the measurement of what the electron is doing right before it hits the screen, right? What you find is that the electron can sense that and in a sense correct for its wave or particle-like behavior depending on if you delay to, to observe it later on or not. So then there's this kind of retro causality weirdness going on that the electron can know ahead of time, in a sense, whether you're going to make you're going to make that observation to maybe backtrack in the in its past to change its behavior. Again, the, again, the experiment itself, and I encourage um, the listeners to to uh, actually do a search on that delayed choice experiment. It's very clever how you know actually, and it's been tested actually. That's the important thing about it is that it has been tested. It is the case. And it's weird stuff. Very weird stuff. Very weird stuff. But reality confronts us. It is the universe in which we live. Now, yep, I don't need I, I don't need to I don't need to like go into some, um, you know, uh, what do you call it? So it's trans state to explore a weird reality. It's right in front of our faces. Yeah. Right in front of our faces in a repeatable experiment. Now, That's this right. this brings up the idea that okay, we're conscious, right? So, and we're in the universe. So consciousness is a property of the universe. It clearly exists and we're here. So this brings up the, I believe you call it the anthropocentric principle that conscious life is here in order to observe the universe in order to, I assume, collapse its wave function. Is that, is that how that works? There's a, that's right. Now, what, what you're saying, there are variants of that, but that's the basic idea. Now, how does that work? I mean, do we ever have a hope of understanding the relationship of being conscious beings in this universe? Or will consciousness of itself, you think, ever, you know, forever remain a mystery? Well, I come from the tradition of physicists like Leon Cooper, who believe that there's no, no problems that we, we claim to be impossible. We just didn't work hard enough. That's That was his take. At least when he discovered superconductivity, he proved that point to his generation because people thought superconductivity was going to be impossible to solve. So I would say that, no, I, I, I do believe, I do believe that, as you said, it's a property of our universe. It's a property of our physical universe. And so because of that, you know, it, 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 is, um, it is subject to the interrogation of a theoretical, of a physicist and other scientists, because it's also, you know, it's happening in, with, you know, with brain matter, uh, at least in our case, right? So... It's very interesting. It's a very interesting set of questions. And I think something I'm interested in. Now, in the book, which I should tell everybody, uh, the book is interesting. It's an exploration of various physical principles and everything, almost an extension or a uh, related to a brief history of time. And it's sort of in that grain, but not quite. Oh. And it's called Fear of a Black Universe, an Outsider's Guide to the Future of Physics. Could you give us an overview of the book and what would the readers expect to find yeah. So the, first of all, the title of the book was meant to sort of make an equate this idea of like when you're a kid, you're afraid of the dark. We name all of our black holes, dark energy, you know, dark matter. So it's a sort of play on words, but also the fear factor. Sometimes when we think about dark, we can think about a state of stigma, the black widow spider. There are all these, I, I guess, presumptions that are made associated with that word. 
Um, and the idea of the play was that there are ideas that are also dark. There are ideas that will get you in trouble as a physicist, let's say, or make you lose respect. And I call it, so that's that's the dark universe as well. So, but it was also not a favorite, one of my favorite hip hop albums called Fear of a Black Planet by Public Enemy. And um, so the book was meant to be a playful, it was going to be very playful from where I came from, which was, I wanted to, I always wanted to write a book in the spirit of my heroes, Stephen Hawking and Richard Feynman, basically with no holes barred, without watering things down, I wanted to have a conversation with an interested public of really, of people who are smart. They're just not professional physicists, but they think a lot about physics or, or they should be thinking about it. And I wanted to kind of like make the book like a fireside chat type of conversation where I basically, the goal is to, to do two things. The goal was for me to, to first give an overview of the modern, of like modern physics, like where, we, where we're at now in terms of like quantum um, attempts of, of a theory of quantum gravity to theories beyond the standard model, dark matter, like all the, all the cutting edge things that we are now working on. I wanted to give the reader a really good, a really good understand of that. And the way I want, I set that up at the beginning of the book is to not explain the physics through the lens of, oh, here's this equation, here's that equation, here's this concept, but to realize that that's kind of like being in the jungle, what I call a jungle of physics, you know? But if you can soar above the jungle and get a bird's eye view, you'll be able to see how things are connected. And I decided to do that by talking about three fundamental principles that underlie, that unite all of known physics, modern physics. And those principles were the principle of invariance or the symmetry principle, um, one. Two, the, the principle core to quantum mechanics, which makes quantum mechanics very special, the superposition principle. And then the principle of emergence by then playing with you know, really setting the foundation without giving any jargon and teaching the jargon. Then the rest of the book was for me to invoke in bulk in my own dark ideas and have fun speculating about the solutions and ways into solving the issues of the problem of consciousness and the origin of life in the universe and alien dark energy, all these, you know, so it was the second part is just me having fun speculating because no one killed anyone from theorizing. And I'm still alive, actually. Demonstrably. <laughs> um, <laughs> now, you are also a musician, a saxophonist, and you've worked with many famous musicians, including Brian Eno. And so you kind of have a dual career thing going. Do you see a relation between music and the somewhat mathematical nature of music and physics? Do they sort of converge in your mind yes and in a lot of respects i mean first of all both of them are you know like music is has structure there's always a sense of structure in music and how that structure unfolds temporally and of course there's in some music the music i play jazz music there's a lot of improvisation around that structure and then there's a sense of wholeness and a sense of in music a sense of um a sense of wholeness a sense of um as you know, harmony, harmony and elegance in, good, in great music. I'm thinking of some of my favorite like themes, I don't really, I'll get back to that in a second, but harmony and all that stuff. And if you look at like, when we look at what we know about our physical laws, like say quantum field theory, and how quantum field theory manifests itself in the standard model of particle interaction. Yeah, there's a sense in which we still have these, you know, almost 20 parameters to fix experimentally. But the way the theory is, the way the theory works, in a sense, the standard model, you could see the harmony. You can see the harmony in terms of like you know how left and right-handed electrons oscillate back and forth to generate mass. You know, there, there's just all this harmony um, in, in, in a similar sense. There's also improvisation in the way the way quantum mechanics works. You know, things are there's a sense of of randomness and chance, but all of a sudden it ends up weaving a beautiful melody, right? So yeah, there, there's a lot, and there's a lot of differences between them as, as well. What are the, and it's a very ancient idea, the harmony of the spheres of the ancient Greeks. Oh, I, I think our physicists, the, you know, the, the um, as you said, what do you call it? The, the heritage of physics started, as you said, with the Pythagoreans, which started with this idea that the harmony, as you said, the music of the spheres, the planets were playing this harmony. And that brings us to string theory, which again, regardless of what people think of string theory, 
it's also based sort of on that idea, right? Yeah, if you think string theory is, if, you know, pretty much is like if the universe, um, you know, like realizes itself in terms of music, as you know, music that's relative to humans. Uh, yeah, take a string. String theory just says everything boils down to vibrating quantum strings. That's the, the, the fundamental reality of these things. Space time comes out of it. The standard model comes out of it. It's a beautiful idea that that does it lends itself directly to music. Now we we talk about beauty, and there's different types. And in your other book, the Jazz of Physics, goes into this. The <laughs> the idea of beauty, symmetry, and elegance. Do you think that it is an error to spend too much time looking at the elegance of equations and <laughs> made the universe actually be much more messy than that? Yeah, I mean, if, you know, that's the noble. That's I mean, so that is the age. That is a question, right? We've been on a path uh, when we identify symmetry, for example, and the relationships due to symmetry between different forces as a form of elegance. So, you know, let's go look for that type of elegance. So I think that another direction to go in is to shift what you also mean by elegance. I think, for example, an emergent phenomenon is elegant, even though good luck trying to track the, you know, if I'm looking at how water becomes, uh, water vapor becomes a liquid, good luck track, you know, tracking the motions of and interactions of billions of, of uh, molecules. For some reason, the system just doesn't care. It has, has its completely new properties that's not defined by those constituents. So there's like, so that that's elegant, but there's complexity involved there as well. So also, as you said, it could be that fundamentally, you know, um, the universe, there is a sense of lawlessness about the universe <laughs> as you know, it has both laws and lawlessness. I don't know how to define lawlessness in that context, but, but time, you know, experiments will, will hopefully guide us in the right direction. There's always an uncertainty, especially when you're talking about <laughs> quantum mechanics in that there are things you cannot know, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So do you think, let me ask you this, doctor, do you think we will ever have a complete understanding of how the universe works? I'm going to flat out say no. Flat out? Um, flat out say no. Now, I think that, first of all, it's already unbelievable that our limited minds uh, were, were able to, again, like transcend or go beyond what we can't perceive, you know, our, our perceptual apparatus. And we're able to somehow discover and imagine physical reality that transcends our so-called limitations. The question is, is our imagination fundamentally limited? And I can't help, I mean, my, my take on that is I think we have, we have a fundamental limitation with our, with our, you know, our brains um, has a fundamental limitation to fully comprehend the entirety of the universe. Do you think that there are others out there that are better at understanding the universe than we are, say an alien civilization. Do you think that there's room to be, to transcend our level of intelligence and go to alien super intelligence? Do you think that that's viable? I do think it's viable. I don't know what that looks like, but we do have the imagination. So I can imagine that, I don't know if you could imagine a being that could perceive parallel events uh, at the same time. I'm talking about direct perception of that. I mean, we, when we look at, you know, I mean, here's one, one interesting um, ability. So right now I'm actually watching a bunch of cars move back, back and forth from my office window. And, but normally I can only focus on one or a few cars localized in one place at the same time. Imagine if I, I had the ability to actually focus actually on multiple like motions of objects and have attention simultaneously operating. That's an interesting ability. Certainly I don't have it. I don't know if you have it, but, um, but I can imagine creatures having that ability. Maybe they do. And a, a biologist can tell me, but that's a, that's an example of something, you know, whether or not you can have that kind of ability or consciousness. And yeah, so I would say that I'm open about that kind of stuff. Now, you have come up with an idea, 
regarding alien quantum computing. And quantum computing seems to be on the table for us eventually, if we can make it work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this idea that that w might actually constitute a techno signature. In other words, you might be able to detect alien quantum computing. Could you lay that idea out? No, we kind of left it as a like uh, like a cliffhanger, <laughs> but I I guess the cliffhanger hanger worked because you you um, you ran off with it exactly. And that's right. If we could actually figure out how to look for localized dips in energy, because you know you're run you 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 take an energy a lot of energy in that region, how you would see that that's another story. Now this is dark energy, right? That's the thing that that was weird about that. And again, this was a play on ideas. It was never meant. I, you know, we did, we certainly didn't take it seriously, but based on the spirit of um, the tradition of thought experiments, this was a thought experiment to try to see if we can generate any new ideas about dark energy. So that's why the, the aliens are using dark energy in whatever way they can do it, because they're advanced and we're not, to, as a resource um, to run their uh, very greedy compu supercomputers, quantum computers, and play so video games, to play very advanced video games. Very advanced video. Well, a very yeah. advanced video game could come in the form of an alien civilization that's uploaded itself into the cloud and is <laughs> using enormous amounts of energy to keep its civilization going internally in a computer, according to the futurists, which is interesting. Yeah, that could that that makes sense. You know, that makes sense if you change the substrate to, so it's not dependent on being in the Goldilocks zone. But you wouldn't want to be if you were a computer. You don't. You don't really. What you need is cold, right? Exactly. You want to be away from the heat. That's exactly the point. That's right. Now, some people have, have raised the idea of a galactic habitable zone, and they always seem to say, "Well, they won't be at the outer reaches of the galaxy. There's not enough material out there." But it seems to me that a, a quantum computing machine civilization would go there because that's where it's coldest. Do, do you think that has legs? Well, you know, we, we tend to hone the best of quantum mechanics at very low temperatures, close to absolute zero. You can maintain a lot of quantum purity when the thermal agitations are, are minimized. So yeah, absolutely. You would have to figure out how to power it and keep while it remaining cold. But again, alien civilizations, they can, I'm sure they, ha they have a way of um, sequestering that. Now, you mentioned a paper that came out um... <laughs> frozen out of time where time is about to convert itself into space perhaps now I, I know this is a different paper and and you weren't involved in it but it's interesting you mentioned it because it's a really wild idea can you uh give a, a quick overview of that idea and what you as a physicist think about it yeah it's an interesting idea i mean you know black holes have that property if you cross the event horizon what what it was once a uh, an observer, you know, perceiving a temporal evolution when, you know, becomes uh, a, you're observing now, you're rotating into a spatial dimension. And so the theory of relativity does admit those types of processes for those types of observers, of course, um, crossing the event horizon is already another interesting question. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm open-minded about it's anything that, that, that deals with the beginning of the universe, you know, um, going through or beyond the Big Bang, something weird has to happen. And we got to entertain it all and see if it spits out predictions that we can go and look for, you know, fossil, whatever, <laughs> remnants of, of, of that process. Now, dark energy, um, this, these mysterious things, dark things, like dark, <laughs> most of the universe is in fact in the form of dark matter and dark energy. We don't really know, we know almost nothing about 95 percent of the universe right yes so can we even really speculate about it i mean for example with dark energy something is driving the expansion of the universe we clearly see it so something must be there but do you think that there are alternate ideas to this idea of dark energy or dark matter do you think that there's let's take dark matter for example we see that we see evidence of it in the behavior of galaxies. They would fly apart if it wasn't there. But do you right. think that it may be that since we don't really have a great understanding of gravity either, that there might be an alternative idea here where our ideas of gravity are simply wrong? That's correct. So what dark energy could be signaling since we see this acceleration of space of our universe at large distance scales, not like, you know, we don't see, I don't see 
that that effect happened in front of my face right now. It's happening really, really far away. So it could be that gravity itself just gets modified uh, or changes its character to basically create what, what we call self-acceleration on those large distance scales. And so, yeah, so many of us, many of my colleagues, uh, one of my colleagues at UPenn, Mark Trotten and his collaborators wrote, oh, and one of my buddies from grad school, Damian Eason at University of um, Arizona State. He, they wrote on one of the first models that tried to explain dark energy as a signal that gravity itself changed. Space-time changes on those very large distance scales. So I'm very sympathetic and have worked on those types of ideas myself. Of course, it could just actually be that it is a form of energy that doesn't modify general relativity, but the jury's still out. Now, in regards to uh, the many worlds interpretation that we talked about briefly, do you subscribe to it? Do you think that, that uh, that's the case? Or is it maybe a step too far to say that there are an infinite number of different realities that are always splitting off from each other? Do you think that the that, that claim, that extraordinary claim, really needs more proof than we have? Do you think that that's maybe a step too far in physics to invoke that when we don't really have an indication of it? Yeah, no, it's a very good point. I mean, it seems that like one of the things that is that a theories like string theory seems to be comfortable with is that type of picture that because you know string theory has many possible realizations of its solutions to realize the regions of space time with where the properties of the forces differ from place to place. And that combined with the idea of inflation or what we call I should know this by now. Uh, but anyway, eternal inflation. It seems to fit nicely with what string theory is asking for. So that picture, that inflation, you can have different pockets of the universe inflating at different rates. And in every every pocket is a world that contains different forces, types of forces. And we happen to have hit the jackpot to be in the one where the forces are what they are it is plausible. I, I used to not like it years ago. But I've learned to embrace it because it seems that like that seems to be a property of string theory. And I still like string theory a lot, actually. I do too, because <laughs> yeah. it, 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 I mean, it has, it has its advantages. But then I wonder to myself, I'm like, are you only liking it because of its beauty? <laughs> but right. we still, we still right. need some way to link general relativity and quantum mechanics. So. Mm -hmm. If we don't have string theory, we're going to have to come up with something. Do you think that there's, do you think there's anything, do we have a path? Okay. Say we, string theory is untestable and we don't think it's the case. Well, where do we go from there? I mean, do we have any seeds for other ideas? Yeah. Yeah. I think that like, you know, uh, my take on this is that um, string theory is a very useful tool. I mean, there are things and questions you can ask with the facility of, of string theory that it's hard to ask with other theoretical frameworks and it's just stuck, you can't do a calculation. So string theory is very useful for that as a, a playground to explore ideas. But there are other approaches and I think directions to, to explore. I think young people who are looking to do, I mean, one thing, for example, various attempts like loop quantum gravity or its covariant formulation spin foam. I think there's some really interesting questions to ask there. People have done that already. My mentor, Abai Ashtakar, Lee Smolin, Carlo Rivelli, uh, Martin Boyerwald. So they have like, you know, there's a whole school of people working on that stuff in loop quantum gravity. But yeah, I, you know, I've like, you know, even started thinking about my own ideas. <laughs> so one place I find to be interesting though, is matrix theories. Theories, because it looks like when I look at all these approaches to quantum gravity, there's some version of them that looks like a matrix theory. And I find that very compelling and I think a interesting direction to look at. Now, matrix theory, and, and this gets into even deeper questions like simulation theory. Do you think that the universe is, could be a simulation? Not in this, if it's in the sense of that, like, um, you know, that the hardware it's running on. I mean, if it is a simulation, it is both, it's, it's a software and a hardware at the same time. So, it's a weird kind of simulation. But it's, I think also that there's a, there's indeterminism in the simulation and whatever the simulation is, it has to figure out what the laws themselves are. 
it's a one thing I can say. It's process. It is. I mean, this is not me. This is David Bohm and um, actually John Wheeler. They they think of the universe as process. In that sense, it's a simulation. Ultimately, well, let's wrap this back to you, music. Now, when you sit and play the saxophone, do you? What do you envision? I mean, do you think of these ideas as you play? No, no, I don't. But I think what happens is like with anything. Anything where you go offline, you know, you're working on some problem. You're trying to. This doesn't even apply in just the sciences, I think. And then you go do something else, something that you just completely take your mind off this problem. Okay, I, for me, playing music, start, you know, practicing that engagement, engagement with sound. I don't know enables the problem solving problems I'm trying to work on. Uh, it just puts it way offline, and maybe. Something interesting is happening offline, but I, I just know that sometimes it helps me, it helps me do better physics. But I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes we don't. Now, uh, what are you doing uh, as far as musical projects? What do you have going there? Oh yeah, yeah. So um, I find I, you know, so I this for a couple of months I really couldn't get myself to play or even practice. I just didn't really feel like playing music. I guess it was, uh, and then it occurred to me when I um, I was in New York on sabbatical. This past year, and then I, when I came back to Brown, I reconnected with two friends of mine. One his name is Hash. Um, his name is Ashish Fias. He plays the bass for a band called Thievery Corporation. He's a tremendous bassist. It's got amazing groove. And my friend Shrini Vasredi, we call him Shrini. He's a professional sitar player. And we decided to like play music that was um, steeped in the Carnatic. In, um, Indian music tradition, so you know, playing with ragas, and then like, and then I wanted to kind of explore that with jazz in a way that was also modern. So we got like interest in electronics involved with this as well. So we call ourselves Metaverse, M-E-T-A verse, Metaverse, and it's supposed to express the, the kind of like all the different cultures that that all we all bring into the music to make this type of music. It's still going to be um, improvisational. But it's like jazz with like, you know, combined with like Indian ragas, you know. That that sounds awesome. That's a, <laughs> a fusion of of jazz and Indian ragas. That's that's pretty cool. So it's it, I guess you'd call it uh, world jazz at that point, right? Yeah, I guess if you want to call it that, sure. I mean, one thing for me, though, I, I, I was interested in this because, you know, half of the country I was born in Trinidad um, so is of East a Indian ancestry. So I grew up in a lot of that kind of music. So. The other thing that why this is interesting to me is like it's an opportunity for me to learn some of that that way of playing music and um, that tradition. I'm talking about the Indian music. Now, when did you when did you make the move from uh, Trinidad and Tobago to uh, the Bronx? I was eight years old when I did that. Do you go back? Oh, I try to go every year. I, it's still like it's still like a second home to me. So I try to go back, obviously not in the last two years, but yeah. <laughs> yeah travel has not been great, easy. <laughs> great food, great food, great beaches. Uh, what, why wouldn't you want to go? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I love, I love all of and great, them. Islands, and, great, right? and great people. And great people. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Doctor. Everybody should check out Dr. Stefan Alexander's books, The Jazz of Physics and Fear of a Black Universe, An Outsider's Guide to the Future of Physics. And also check out your music. Where, where can people find your... Yeah, so if you go on any of the platforms, YouTube and you know, Apple Music, and uh, do a Google search with my for album, Here Comes Now, or search my name on Apple Store or uh, Spotify, you'll find my stuff. All right, thanks for joining us today, Docker, and hope to talk to you again sometime soon. Yes, thank you. This was a great pleasure. <laughs>